In Los Angeles, a killer the police are calling the Hillside Strangler has murdered 10 young women and left their bodies on the hillsides along the highways. Today, the police found another. It was a grisly scene. Day after day, the bodies of boys and young men being taken out of the home of John Wayne Gacy. 29 decomposed corpses were found under the house and surrounding grounds. Four other bodies were discovered in a river several miles away. At first, Los Angeles police thought that the murder of a young woman last March was an isolated act of violence, but since then they've come to believe it was connected to a wide-ranging series of assaults by a killer who's become known as the Night Stalker. Fighting co-eds at Florida State University in Tallahassee walked a class in groups today while detectives tried to track a man who slipped into a sorority house early yesterday and murdered two women. Authorities marched out of the house with boxes of severed body parts. In a barrel wheeled out a vat of acid. In a refrigerator, left as it was found, at least two heads, the severed remains of victims of the alleged murderer. In Seattle today, a man called the Green River Killer has finally confessed to murdering 48 women and girls. someone who was cold, calculating, manipulative, and dangerous. But is this true? How much has the definition of a psychopath become warped by fiction? What is a psychopath? Psychopathy is defined as a cluster of both personality traits and socially deviant behaviors. Let me go ahead and introduce to you a man by the name of Robert D. Hare. When we talk about reprobates, I'm going to be getting all of my proof from the Word of God. When we talk about psychopaths, I'm going to be getting all of my proof from this book. And the reason I want to do that is because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to go to the expert in regards to psychopathy. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about Robert D. Hare, PhD. And, and he doesn't, you know, I don't know him, he doesn't know me, and I don't know that he would agree with, with what we believe. Dr. Robert Hare is known as the godfather of psychopathy. A forensic psychologist at the University of British Columbia, he developed the psychopathy checklist used by law enforcement agencies and courts all over the world to identify those clusters of traits that only show up in psychopaths. His groundbreaking book, Without Conscience, pinpoints the hallmark of any psychopath, a total disregard of right and wrong. Most of the psychopaths are living right next to us and living a reasonably normal life but creating some sort of distress psychological or environmental or financial for others around them. And psychopaths have always been with us, as far back as the written record. You're going to run into one of these individuals sometime in your life, more than once, 
and the encounter could either be exhilarating, thrilling, exciting, or devastating. More likely the latter. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. The study of psychopathic behavior is relatively new. It's been Bob Hare's life work. His diagnostic checklist is based on research with hundreds of criminals in Canadian prisons. If I want to study something, I go where it's likely to be. So the prevalence of psychopathy in prisons is high and access to information is readily available. While psychopaths make up 25% of violent offenders in prison, most psychopaths are not criminals. It's estimated that between 1 and 2% of the general adult male population are psychopaths. They could be your neighbor, your boss, your friend, or your spouse. Hare considers them society's most dangerous individuals. His diagnostic checklist measures 20 key personality characteristics which reveal psychopathic traits. Egocentric, lacking remorse, guilt and empathy, deceitful, glib and shallow. Hare's checklist scores those characteristics on a scale from 0 to 40. The average score in a population might be 1 or 2. The average score in prisons is about 20, 21. And we use 30 out of 40 as a convenient threshold for defining psychopathy. Now that's very, very high, and that's light years away from the average person. In the general population, what other person gets a score of 10? I mean, this is, this is well below the threshold for psychopathy, but if you look at the characteristics, these are probably not very nice people. Score ranges from 0 to 40. And the higher you score, the more extreme your psychopathy. The checklist is valuable because it's the first internationally validated tool that could be used anywhere in the world to measure degrees of psychopathy. But it can also be used then to predict what's going to happen to a prisoner when they're released from jail. The word psychopath, literally a sick or suffering mind, first emerged back in 1888. It covered a wide range of antisocial behaviors and mental and sexual deviancy. Psychiatrists are still grappling for the causes of this personality disorder. In the early 1900s, psychopathy, as it was called, was thought to be relatively rare. But in the aftermath of World War I, thousands of soldiers needed medical help to deal with battle trauma. In spite of treatment, many veterans still displayed mental problems like aggression and antisocial behavior many years after the war. I'm young. I'm young. But the few psychiatrists there were at the time were mystified. Psychiatrists are forced to try to understand the behavior of men who have broken down in battle. And some of them present a real problem. Some of them respond to treatment, to re-education, persuasion, occupational therapy, and others don't. And whatever they do, they don't get better. And when they dig a bit deeper into these soldiers, they find that they've got poor conduct records. They've got a list of convictions for bad behavior, for fighting, for getting into trouble. It seemed they all had something in common, but what was far from obvious. It was Dr. Hervey Cleckley who made the breakthrough. He was working with psychiatric patients at an army veterans hospital in Georgia. He realized that many of the soldiers had been mentally disturbed before they became soldiers. He realized it was their personalities that were severely disordered. He comes to some surprising conclusions. He thinks that at least 18% of the veterans there are psychopaths. And this fuels his belief that it's a problem of much greater scale than anyone imagines. When Dr. Cleckley began working in public hospitals in the 1930s, he noticed large numbers of patients who behaved just like those disturbed soldiers he'd seen before. He began to identify psychopathy by making the first ever definitive list of psychopathic personality traits. Cleckley came up with 21 traits, such as superficial charm, 
insincerity, antisocial behavior, lack of shame, lack of empathy, and no sexual morals. In 1941, Dr. Cleckley published his acclaimed book, The Mask of Sanity. Soon the term psychopath was on everyone's lips, because Cleckley's conclusions were shocking. These are people who appear to be normal. They have the mask of normal behavior, normal interactions. They're often attractive personalities, plausible speakers, well-dressed, accomplished. But the reality is, because they have no feelings, they're willing to exploit and even to kill. So they're dangerous, but very difficult to spot. Psychopaths don't act or look crazy. They're not mentally ill. In fact, they're masters at appearing normal. Their main defect, what psychologists call severe emotional detachment, is harder to diagnose than schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. They don't feel emotion, but act as if they do. They know right from wrong, but lack remorse and empathy. Psychopaths are pathological liars who love to con and manipulate others. Now here's what you need to understand about psychopaths, okay? Because usually when you use the term psychopath, people think a crazy man. They think somebody who's insane. They think of somebody who's, who's uh, foaming at the mouth or whatever. And here's what you need to understand. Psychopaths are not insane. They are not crazy. Here's what uh, he wrote in page five. Psychopathic killers, however, are not mad. According to the accepted legal and psychiatric standards, their acts result not from a deranged mind, but from a cold, calculating rationality combined with a chilling inability to treat others as thinking, feeling human beings. Here's what he wrote on page 22. Psychopaths are not disoriented or out of touch with reality, nor do they experience the delusions, hallucinations, or intense subjective distress that characterize most other mental disorders. Psychopaths are rational and aware of what they are doing and why. Their behavior is the result of choice, freely exercised. What does the word reprobate mean? Because we're talking about the reprobate doctrine. Well, you know, the Bible serves as its own dictionary. We should always allow the Bible to define itself. Before we go to other dictionaries and other sources, we should allow the Bible to define itself. And the Bible tells us what the word reprobate means. Go to the book of Jeremiah in your Bible. Jeremiah 6.30. Notice what the Bible says. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Now, you say, why does it say reprobate silver? The analogy that's being used here is that when they would uh, purify silver and they would heat it up, all of the things that were unusable, that were good for nothing, would, would surface up and they would remove that, that top layer as they would purify the silver and they would say it was reprobate silver. They would say it was silver that was good for nothing. It was useless. It was only meant to be rejected. Rejected. And here he says, when people call someone, he says, they're going to call them reprobate silver. Here's what he's saying. When someone calls a man a reprobate, it's because the Lord hath rejected them. I want you to notice three key elements in regards to a reprobate. Number one, you need to understand that they were exposed to and had an opportunity to receive the truth. These are not people who never had an opportunity to get saved, who never had an opportunity to hear the truth. They were at one point exposed to the truth. They were at one point, they did at one point have an opportunity to receive the truth. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse number 18. The Bible says this, For the wrath of God, notice these words, is revealed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. I want you to notice there, the, the idea is that heaven or nature reveals the wrath of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Notice this phrase, who hold the truth. So notice, it's not that they don't have the truth. It's not that they never were exposed to the truth. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice verse 19, because that which, notice these words, may 
be known of God, notice, is manifest in them. I want you to notice that word in. It says it's manifest in them. You say, what is that referring to? Because first he says that it's revealed from heaven. From the outward nature manifest the, the glory of God. But then it says that it's also revealed in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You say, what is that a reference to? That is a reference to your conscience. Romans chapter 2, look at verse number 14. The Bible says this, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, and notice, it's talking about the Gentiles who were not given the oracles of God. They were not given the law of God. They were not given the word of God. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, notice what the Bible says, do by nature, I want you to remember those words, by nature, the things contained in the law, these having not the law, notice, are a law unto themselves. Notice verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You say, what is that talking about? It's talking about the fact that God has put in the hearts of men, in the minds of men, a conscience that even when they do not have the laws of God, even in, in cultures and societies where they may have never read the Ten Commandments, they know it's wrong to kill. They know it's wrong to steal. They know God has put a conscience inside of man that basically reveals to them the fact that there is someone that they are accountable to. There are things that are right and that are wrong. It says there, having not the law are a law unto themselves. The law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. That's what Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, if you want to flip back to verse 1, when it says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So I want you to notice that these people have been exposed to the truth. They have a conscience inside of them that tells them that there is a God. And by the way, people don't, by nature, believe that there is no God. They have to be taught that there is no God. By nature, people believe in a God. They believe they might not know about the God of the Bible. They might not know about the Lord Jesus Christ. But in them, in their heart, is put the consciousness that comes from God. Here's the other characteristic of a reprobate, is that they choose to resist, or the Bible says deny, reject, the truth over and over again. Look at verse 21 again, Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they knew God, notice, they glorified Him not as God. So they knew God, but they chose to glorify Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Look at verse 23. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So notice, they changed the glory of God into an image made like to corruptible man. Look at verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Remember, they had the truth, they hold the truth, but they changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Look at verse 28, and even as... Now what does that mean? That means in the same way that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So it's not that they did not have God in their knowledge. It's not that they were not aware of God or had an opportunity uh, to believe on God or believe uh, the truth. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I want you to notice the third element of a reprobate, even as or in the same way that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You say, what's the third element? It's number three. God eventually chooses to reject them. See, they are exposed to the truth. They have an opportunity to receive the truth. They choose to reject the truth. And then eventually, after doing that over and over and over again, God eventually chooses to reject them. And they become 
a reprobate. Verse 24, wherefore, is that word wherefore? Wherefore means for that reason, for this reason. What reason? Because they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corrupt all men. Wherefore, for that reason, God also, don't miss these words, gave them up. You say, well, God never gives up on anybody. Well, he gave them up, he gave up on these people. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own lust to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Notice, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this cause. For what cause? Because they changed the truth of God into a lie. For this cause, God gave them up. I don't think we should ever give up. Well, God gave up. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The word reprobate, according to the Bible, means rejected. But here's what's interesting. You know, we, we first look at the Bible definition, right? Because the Bible is the authority. But I decided to just look up the word reprobate in the dictionary. Because, you know, today you have Christians who fight us on this doctrine. And they'll say, oh, I can't believe that you would teach that God would give up, to, uh, give up on anybody. Well, have you not read Romans 1? I can't believe that you would think that God, you know, would ever just say that people can't be saved. You know, so I looked up the definition of the word reprobate. And listen to me, I didn't look it up in some theological dictionary, okay? I didn't look it up in some commentary defining the word. I looked it up on dictionary.com. All right, now, I don't, I don't know, I don't know a lot about dictionary.com, but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think the website's ran by independent Baptists, all right? I don't think it's ran by extreme fundamentalists. And when you type in the word reprobate, it gives you two definitions. Because, you know, often when you look up a word in a dictionary, you get several definitions. Here are the two definitions that come up under dictionary.com for the word reprobate. Number one, a depraved, unprincipled, or wicked person. Number two, a person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. Now, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that dictionary.com understands that the word reprobate means a person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation, but the average independent Baptist today can't figure out the word, what the word reprobate means. This doctrine of reprobates, people try to act like, oh, you guys just came up with that. You're out to lunch. You're just these kooky, backward, extreme fundamentalists. You know, you guys, you guys made this up. No one's ever believed that. But listen to me very carefully. Christians have believed the doctrine of reprobates through history. There is no new thing under the sun. And I want to give you just one example of that. Because, you know, the independent fundamental Baptists will attack us for believing this. And they'll say, we can't believe you believe in reprobate. We can't believe that you believe that God would give up on anybody. That God would reject anybody. That anybody could cross the line and no longer be able to be saved. We can't believe that you would believe that. But let me just bring up one example. There's a man who I actually, you know, think was a good man. He's passed away now by the name of Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles pastored the largest independent Baptist church during his lifetime. He pastored a church with over 10,000 people in it. He has big ministry, successful pastor. He was the founder and chancellor of the largest independent fundamental Baptist Bible college, Hiles Anderson College. Now, I don't necessarily recommend Bible colleges, but I'm just telling you, this guy was the founder and chancellor of the most successful IFB Bible college during his lifetime, Hiles Anderson College. He was a sought-out speaker all across the world. He was, during his lifetime, the undisputed leader of fundamentalism. I mean, you cannot get more mainstream IFB than Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles clearly taught the doctrine of reprobates. Listen to his words. Please listen to me. I'm coming to some very serious territory right now. Don't miss this. Don't miss it. Let me warn you. Please, let me warn you. 
there is a line drawn over which you cannot be saved. If you think that you can just wait till you die and on your deathbed you can come to Christ, you've got nothing coming. Here your life is. Out yonder somewhere, I do not know where. There is a line. I don't know where it is. But that line is drawn, and when you cross over that line, from that moment forward, you will never have a chance to be saved. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, God gave them up. Are you listening? God gave them up. Now, one of these days, you're going to hear the gospel for the last time and say no, and God's going to say, okay, I'll knock on somebody else's door, and I'll not knock on your door anymore. In Romans 1.26, it says, God gave them up. In Romans 1.28, it says, God gave them over. In Genesis 6.3, my spirit will not always strive with man. In Ephesians 4.19, who being past feeling, have given themselves over. That was Jack Hiles. That was the, the most sought out preacher in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And he clearly taught that there's a line drawn. And when you cross it, you can no longer be saved. And he taught it out of Romans 1. Amen. And today the independent fundamental Baptists who will have pictures of this man in their foyers. Who will, you know, name auditoriums after him and say this is their hero. They look at us and say, you guys are out to lunch. You guys are extremists. It's because you didn't go to Bible college. You're uneducated. That nobody believes that. Well, your hero did. Well, your leader did. Uh, you say, why are you reading? I'm just explaining to you. This is not something that we came up with. This is not something that we made up. So even though mainstream Christianity has chosen to ignore the reprobate doctrine, God is raising a new generation of preachers who have not shunned to declare all the counsel of God, including the reprobate doctrine. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. They're stiff-necked, they're hard-hearted, they're resisting God. And, it's, and, and, and that's what we're warned about here. And there's, there's a parallel here. God, I've just gone through several verses and we see Antichrist and Christian. We see sons of the devil and sons of God. We see children of darkness and children of light. And that's why the sermon is called reprobate or redeemed. If you've been redeemed, you can never become reprobate. You have the reject and the elect. They've been rejected of God. Hey, we're elected because of our faith. People are getting mad and saying that we're haters and all this other stuff. Well, yeah, I do. I hate filthy faggots and I hate perverts and I hate child molesters. And I don't have a problem saying that, you know. But the, the reason why people are so upset about it is because everybody is so brainwashed by the television and by the media and everything else that they don't even know what normal is anymore. The Bible says this, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish. Notice this, why are they going to perish? Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And notice what God does to them. Remember, they rejected the right way. They rejected the truth, is what the Bible is showing us. And look what the Bible says in verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Don't tell me God's not rejected these people. When it comes to the reprobate doctrine, you know, we believe, you know, as did the previous generation of Baptist preachers, that a person can reach a point in their life where they've crossed a line that they can never come back from. You know, and it's not that they committed a specific sin that was too great. That's not what we're saying in this, but they've just rejected God one too many times. They're exposed to God's Word. They hear God's Word. They're explained the truth. They reject God's Word. They harden their own heart while they're continuing to reject the Word of God. They're hardening their heart. Then God gives them up to a reprobate mind, exposed to God's word, reject God's word. They harden their own heart 
while continuing to reject the truth of God, God gives them up and they become what we would call a reprobate. And then they become people that have no feelings towards what is truly right and truly wrong. There are wicked people out there. And, you know, for most normal people, especially for those that are saved, it, 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 it is a very foreign concept to even understand that there are people in this world that literally ponder and think and, and intend to cause harm to other people and to do bad things to people. But they exist. Just because you may not be able to even comprehend, how could that even possibly happen? Who, who in their right mind? You know, well, they're not in their right mind, but regardless of that, there are people that are out to destroy. And the Apostle Paul here is, is, is really trying to stress. He's like, look, I'm, even now I'm weeping, just trying to explain that you would please get this through and understand. I've told you often that there are enemies of the cross of Christ. So we see what happened to them. The same thing happened to Pharaoh. They hardened their heart. So God hardened their hearts, and they blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They rejected Him over and over again, and God finally got a belly of their mess, and He rejected them. They became a reprobate. That's what the word reprobate means. It means rejected. John 12 says they could not believe because God hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Same thing He did to Pharaoh. They held truth and unrighteousness and refused to get saved. We see the progression or rather we, sh we should would say the decline, right? Of someone who has rejected Christ, they've rejected the gospel, and the Bible says that they've been given over to a reprobate mind. Now this is a doctrine that really is rejected even amongst Christians, right? They don't wanna to come to this, this conclusion, this biblical conclusion, that it can get to a point where it's too late for a person, okay? It does, a person can get to a point where it's too late, they've rejected the gospel so much that they can no longer be saved. And that's Bible, okay? And the Bible calls that a reprobate. To whom is the midst of darkness reserved forever? These people that are clouds without water, right? And so dog and swine, when, when you call someone a dog and you call them a swine, you, you are saying that they are without hope. You're saying that these people are, are reprobate. The Bible says that there are people that are rejected by God and their mind and conscience is defiled. And I don't for the life of me understand why independent Baptists can pick up this book and see verse after verse after verse in the book of John where it says they cannot believe. I mean, what don't you understand about that? You either become a Calvinist or you believe that there are people that are rejected. There's no alternative. The Bible says there are people that are children of the devil. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pay attention to that statement. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There's your reprobate mind, right? They're men of corrupt minds. What's their mind like? Their mind is reprobate concerning the faith okay so what does a reprobate mind look like according to this verse it's someone who's ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth what does it mean to not be able to come to the it means you can't you cannot come to the knowledge of the truth why because you've been rejected so what is a reprobate it's someone who's been exposed to the truth they've had an opportunity to have the truth they chose to deny, reject, resist, turn away from the truth. And God eventually rejects them, gives them over to a reprobate mind. You might ask, well, why are you preaching a sermon called Psychopath Reprobates? And this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the connection between a reprobate and a psychopath. Because as I was studying psychopaths, here's what I basically came to the conclusion. Wow, these people are just talking about what the Bible calls a reprobate. You know, the scientists say there's people out there, we call them psychopaths. Well, the Bible talks about these same people that are called reprobate. Now you say, well, what connects? What makes you think that these Psychopaths are reprobates, are one and the same. Well, when you talk to the experts about psychopathy, 
what's often emphasized is their mind. Any lack of conscience. Let me prove it to you. Well, number one, the book written by the expert is called Without Conscience, The Disturbing World of Psychopaths Among Us. I mean, the number one characteristic of psychopaths is that they have a conscience here with a hot iron. At the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Mike Koenix uses an MRI scanner to compare the brains of normal subjects with those of psychopaths in prison. So there's a specific circuit very deep in the brain that is responsive to essentially anything that we find innately pleasurable. So things like money, drugs, sex, chocolate. Um, when you look at a psychopathic brain's response to reward, what we find is that the more psychopathic the individual is, the stronger that this area of the brain lights up to reward, it's called the amygdala, primary sort of fear center of the brain. And another circuit of the brain that we know to be responsible for empathy, for the regulation of emotion, for motivating pro-social behavior, for regulating our moral judgments, we also see some degraded connections in that circuit of the brain. There is reduced connectivity between these two areas of the brain, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The primitive emotions of fear and pleasure seeking weren't being moderated by the brain's executive power center. You have brains that seem to be hypersensitive to reward, brains that seem to be undersensitive to the suffering of others. Um, you know, this is, this is the picture of psychopathy, right? So this is a brain of someone who is very dangerous. When the Bible speaks about reprobates, it emphasizes the mind of a reprobate. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse 28. And as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate. Notice, it doesn't say soul. It doesn't say body. It, does, it says he gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. When the Bible emphasizes the idea of a reprobate, it emphasizes the fact that their mind is a reprobate mind. Their mind has been rejected. You see that throughout the passages on reprobates. And I'm going to show you what happens in the brain of a psychopath. A psychopath's brain, and Dr. Oz, you can ring right in here with me at any point. You were talking about it on your show today. Their prefrontal cortex is thinner, it's under-functioning, it doesn't work as well. The reality is we don't know why that's thinner, but no question about it, the part of our brain that's associated with being human tends to thin out, and it has huge ramifications. I don't know, if, Drew, if this caught your attention, but in so many of the primary reports of these psychopathic killers, they seem emotionless. They're very calm in the face of all this. It's premeditated, they've thought it through, but there's no sense of remorse. Who out there can think, and I don't care what's going on in your life, you could ever defend killing one child, much less 20 of them, without having a sense. So these are not normal folks. And this shows the wide regions of the brain that are not functioning normally, the prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate. Some of the more deeper visceral functions even are out. And Dr. Oz, I think you showed a picture of this on your program today as well, did you not? I did, and it's stunning actually when you realize how these are important structural differences. And I didn't have a chance to read this kind note sent by groups representing autism and Asperger's, but I love, since you're an expert in the area, to highlight uh, the fact that these are not necessarily the same problem. In fact, no. they're very different. Folks who no. have Asperger's and autism, they actually have empathy. They don't want to hurt people. They feel badly when things don't go right. They That's just right. don't have the social skill. Let me put another scan up here. I want to show it, just to give the audience a sense of how complicated our various emotions and and what parts of the brain, range are, the brain rather involved in it. This is hatred. This is the red areas, the hot, very highly functioned areas. These are the areas of the brain associated with moral judgment. And I'll remind you again, the prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate, these visceral areas, very important as well. And finally, the area that is involved with empathy is something late developing and very relatively sort of um, specific areas of the brain associated with that. And again, these are areas that light up hot and it tends to right lateralize. The right part of our brain, the part that's connected to our body, is the part that tends to be most able to attune to other people and the state that those other people are in. The reason those scans you saw are so important is that folks at home are wondering how we're going to help figure out when people like Adam Lanza are, are going to be able to hurt others. This may be the future. It yeah. will probably be through brain scans. We'll be able to help families who, of course, they'd be grieving when they find this out, learn that their kids yep. are never going to have the empathy, no matter what kind of great parenting they're well, offered. And or, when we figure out why that happens, Or we'll maybe there are things people. we can intervene upon with those proclivities, with those predispositions. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8. 
Notice what the Bible says. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Notice what it says. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So when we talk about reprobates in the Bible, what does he say? He says they have a reprobate mind. What does he say? He says they are men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he's talking about false prophets. Remember we saw that in the passages on reprobates already? False prophets, false teachers. Notice what he says about reprobates, these false prophet reprobates in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, remember 2 Timothy 3, it said, in the last days, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And by the way, whenever you see doctrines of devils, children of the devil, children of Beelzebub, children of Belial, those are all reprobates. All right, and, and even when you see the psychopath serial killers, a lot of them are Satan worshipers. Notice what he says, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Okay, so when we talk about reprobates in the Bible, what do we see? We see that they've been given over to a reprobate mind. We see that they are men of corrupt minds. We see that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Of all the violent offenders in our prisons, about one quarter are psychopaths. Many of their crimes are well known and abhorred. It's already known that the brains of psychopaths are built differently. Sections associated with behavior and emotion are actually smaller than those of the general population. It may explain the personality of the psychopath. They're callous, unemotional, they're interpersonally manipulative, and they use aggression in a slightly different way, what we call instrumental aggression, so a cold, premeditated, planned use of aggression to get what they want. Dr. Nigel Blackwood and his U.S.-Canadian team tested how the behavior and emotion parts of the brain respond to a simple reward-punishment game. Volunteers included psychopathic violent offenders, non-psychopathic violent offenders, and a control group, all white British men who were tested while in an MRI machine. They had to choose one of two images on a screen. The right picture resulted in reward points. The wrong choice results in point loss. Then right and wrong are switched. Everyone figures it out, but in those brief moments of losing points, punishment, the scans show the psychopathic brain behaves unusually, processes punishment differently from violent offenders and people with no history of crime. They're not simply insensitive to punishment. There's a very different organization of their uh, reinforcement learning system that shapes their behavior. The new research adds to growing evidence that psychopathy is not just a behavioral problem, but a complex neurological mystery. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. Titus chapter number one. Notice how Titus brings all of this together. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Notice the connection there between their mind and their conscience being defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So notice how the Bible continues to emphasize having their mind and conscience defiled, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, men of corrupt minds, men of a reprobate mind. There is a growing consensus among the experts that psychopathy is a specific biological condition, the result of a malfunction in the brain. Bob Hare's psychopathy checklist is the accepted benchmark for identifying psychopaths. It could also be the key that unlocks the cause of the condition. A lot of people say that this construct of psychopathy is nothing more than a myth. And people have said that it's a moral judgment masquerading in a science. Well, if we define people according to this cluster of characteristics, do they have brain images for a particular task that are different from those of uh, other individuals? And the answer is definitely yes. 
Hare has been using brain scanning techniques to determine whether the mental processes of the psychopath are different from those of the non-psychopath. If they are, it could be revealed in brain images. Some of the brain imaging research that uh, my group and other groups uh, in several parts of the world are now conducting indicates that it appears that the psychopath has difficulty in actually processing, understanding and using emotional material. Now, is this because they are biologically put together differently or they are wired differently right from birth? Or are the brain differences that we observe the result of using different strategies to perform the tasks that we use? We just don't know that yet. In one experiment, a psychopath's response to emotive words is tested, and the brain activity it produces is compared to that of a non-psychopath. The difference is significant. The white areas denote parts of the brain that are actively processing an emotional response to the words. In the brain of the non-psychopath, there is considerable activity. In the psychopath's brain, there is far less. It seems that there is less emotional involvement. Hare's research into the workings of psychopaths' brains is encouraging. It's clear that there are striking differences in areas that are associated with processing emotions. We're interested in uh, what parts of the brain are activated uh, when you're looking at something neutral in connotation, an ordinary picture of a person or an object, or looking at something that has intense emotional connotation, something that's very negative, very, very uh, disturbing to most people. And our prediction, of course, is that the psychopaths will not show the same activation of the same brain regions that we would observe in normal people. When you talk about reprobate in the Bible, what's often emphasized is their mind, their lack of conscience. Well, when you talk to the experts about psychopathy, what's often emphasized is their mind, any lack of conscience. Let's talk about this, the types of psychopaths or the categories of reprobates and the categories of psychopaths. Now, the expert puts psychopaths into two categories. He has, first of all, what I'm going to refer to as the violent criminal. That's your serial killer, rapist, child molester. And then you have what he calls a white collar psychopath or a corporate psychopath. David Cook is a forensic psychologist at the Douglas Inch Center in Glasgow. He's made a close study of psychopaths in prison. They tend to be very versatile in their criminality, so they don't tend to engage in one particular type of crime. They'll engage in a whole variety, so they may engage in violent crime, conning and manipulative crime, they may engage in sex crime, uh, property crime and so forth. So they, they, they cover the whole range of criminal behavior. When we think of psychopaths, we think, we think of the violent criminals. You know, we think of men like John Wayne Gacy, the De Plains, Illinois contractor and junior chamber of commerce man of the year who entertained children as Pogo the Clown. He had his picture taken with President Carter's wife, Rosalind, and murdered 32 young men in the 1970s, burying most of the bodies in the crawl space under his house. And by the way, John Wayne Gacy was a homosexual who raped teen boys. And you know what you're going to find in, is a common theme through these serial killers is that they're all a bunch of homos. They're all a bunch of sodomites. You know, how about Kenneth Bianchi, one of the hillside stranglers who raped, tortured, and murdered dozens of women in the Los Angeles area in the 1970s and turned in his cousin and accomplice, Angelo Buono. How about Richard Ramirez? a Satan-worshipping serial killer known as the Night Stalker, who proudly described himself as evil, was convicted in 1987 
of 13 murders and 31 felonies, including robbery, burglary, rape, sodomy, oral copulation, and attempted murder. How about Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee monster, who pleaded guilty to torturing, killing, and mutilating 15 men and boys and was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms. And by the way, he was an open homosexual. He was a, a necrophiliac and he found his victims at gay bars. How about Ted Bundy, the all-American serial killer who was responsible for the murders of several dozen young women in the mid 1970s, claimed that he had read too much pornography and that a malignant entity had taken over his consciousness. And by the way, he was a rapist, a necrophiliac, and his last victim was a 12-year-old girl. She's a pedophile. For many years, it's been thought that the psychopath leads a terrible life, that they're not successful. The downward spiral was often mentioned in textbooks. But now we know it's quite different for many psychopaths. And maybe it's because they have greater access to education. Every psychopath that I've met has had a college degree, and a couple have had PhDs. So there's greater education, there's the ability to look corporate, to look like a business person, as opposed to what one thinks of as a serial killer. And somebody with a psychopath can put on the costume, talk the language, and have the certificate on the wall and easily convince somebody who owns an organization or is hiring for an organization that they are the ideal employee. Over the years, we've coined the term corporate psychopath to describe this particular individual. They share the same personality disorder, but we want to make them somewhat distinct so that people don't confuse the serial killer with the corporate psychopath. The psychopaths are put into two categories, the violent criminals, and the corporate or white-collar psychopath. Now, here's what's interesting about that, because we're, we're connecting the terms, right? Psychopaths and reprobates. Reprobates are put into two categories in the Bible as well. Did you know that? Let's look at it. The first category is a violent reprobate, a violent rapist killer. You say, well, where does the Bible say that? Go to Judges chapter number 19. Look at verse 22. Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city certain sons of Belial. Okay, who is, what is Belial or Baal or Beelzebub? That's Satan. Remember they said to Jesus, the Pharisees said that by, by Beelzebub he casts out devils and he said to them, you're accusing me of having Satan. All right, the sons of Belial are sons of Satan. Remember we saw in 1 Timothy 4, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring the man that came into thine house that we may know him. All right, now, when it says there that we may know him, this is not a neighborhood welcoming committee. When it says that we may know him, okay, the word know there is the same word uh, that Genesis 4 1 says, you don't have to turn there, when it says, And Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Okay, when the Bible talks about knowing someone in that sense, talk about a physical relationship with them. Okay, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. These sons of Belial, you know, they come out, they beat at the door, they speak to the man in the house, the old man saying, bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. Look at verse 23. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the man would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. Don't miss this. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning when the day began to spring like a bunch of cockroaches, they let her go. 
Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hand were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up and let us be going. But none answered. She was dead. Then the man took her upon an ass and a man rose up and got him unto his place. And I want you to understand this. These were a bunch of sodomites, homosexuals who surrounded the house, they said, we want to know the man. And they said, no, here, take the concubine. And oh, today you got these filthy homosexuals. Oh, well, we just don't have a desire for women. You know, we're just these quirky little, you know, we're just happy-go-lucky, and we don't want to be around women. You know, in the Bible, do you know that every sodomite went both ways? They'll rape anybody. They'll molest anybody. They'll be predators for anybody. They, these men, they came to rape him. But when they got the woman, they just raped her too. And they abused her all night and she died. That's what a reprobate is. It's funny because that's what a psychopath is. Critics and commentators in the past have said that to study 1% of the general population seems to be a waste of time. Why not spend our time studying criminals in general? There are far more criminals than there are psychopaths. And uh, even when we get them into prison, say, well, we're only talking about 15 or 20 percent of the prison population. Is it worth really paying attention to them? It sure is. And the reason is there may only be a small number of psychopaths in the population, but the damage they inflict on society is very widespread. And in fact, I would estimate that the 15 or 20 percent uh, that I'm talking about are responsible for at least half of the violent crime in our society. So we've got to understand this particular disorder. And here in Judges 19, we learn about these reprobates who want to rape a man, ended up raping a woman, ended up killing her. That's your violent psychopath. You got a violent psychopath, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, a bunch of homosexual rapists. And what do you have? You got Judges 19, you got Genesis 19. Now let me say this. We talked about the violent ones. But then there are the white collar or corporate psychopath. But here's what you need to understand. The serial killing rapist psychopaths are actually a rare minority within the psychopath community. Most psychopaths aren't killers, yet they are still extremely dangerous. In fact, the ones that kill and get put in prison, they are the failures. Because a lot of them realize that they're going to go to prison for the rest of their lives. So they're going to get executed. So they choose to go ahead and uh, be predators, you know, in a way that's going to keep them from getting caught. It's not that the corporate psychopath wouldn't do what Ted Bundy does. It's just that they choose not to because they know that's going to give them consequences that they're not willing to live with. You know, among people, normal people, they found that for every hundred people in normal society, there's a psychopath among them. There might be a psychopath among us right now, you know? And, uh, but, here's what, but, but here's what they found. They found as they began to study professionals that are extremely successful, CEOs of companies, you know, religious successful leaders and political leaders that attain high levels in, in politics, they found that the number of psychopaths in those places went up to 25%. One out of four politicians is a psychopath. Is that really that hard to believe? One out of four religious leaders, you know, prominent leaders are psychopaths, which is why the Bible talks about false teachers, false prophets. You know, some of them are killers and some of them are rapists, but a lot of them choose to con and lie and deceive and to hurt people by staying within the lines of what will get them put in prison, but yet they do it in business or through religion or through politics. It's okay, I got it. In fact, the corporate world seems to be a natural habitat for psychopaths. One study of 203 executives across several companies found a much higher incidence of psychopathy than in the general population. Its author was Dr. Paul Babiak. And what we find surprisingly was that there was a rate of 3.9% in that population of individuals that had scored high enough on the psychopathy checklist that they had hit the, the mark. 
for uh, being a, assessed as a psychopath. Babiak, along with Bob Hare, co-authored Snakes in Suits, When Psychopaths Go to Work, the first major study of psychopaths in the boardroom. Their findings caught the media's attention as people sought to understand how the financial crisis happened. Those that we found were rated high in psychopathy were rated very high in communication skills, charisma, uh, visioning, but they were also rated extremely low on performance productivity factors. Despite that, despite having that evidence showing that these were not good performers, the individuals who were psychopaths had very good careers and there was no threat of them losing their jobs. In fact, that they were still on succession plans to move up. While researching his controversial book, Dutton carried out a UK study to find out which occupations attract psychopaths. When we looked at the top 10, it was very, very interesting indeed. Okay, sure, CEOs were number one. We had lawyers at number two. We had uh, media, especially TV uh, and radio, at number three. Uh, we also had surgeons. The list includes hero populations such as law enforcement, rescue services, the military, and special forces. But it's in the cut and thrust of the business world, an arena where traditionally ruthlessness verges on a virtue, that it's becoming increasingly worrying. Paul Barbiak, a personnel consultant, has had his own daunting experiences with psychopaths in suits. I was brought into an organization to work on a team building project. There had been some conflict amongst people in this particular team. And as I interviewed them, uh, half of them identified one person as the source of the conflict. But the other half of the group thought this person walked on water, was absolute uh, dream and, and even future leader of the company. As I interviewed him, I found that I personally liked him very much. However, over time, he began to do things that were very bizarre. He would accidentally bump into a vice president and then once he realized who it was, of course he really knew who it was, he would start um, praising this individual and fawning after him and ingratiating himself with the vice president. Others would see him with the VP and think that he had some sort of influence, which he really didn't have. Then he would take this perception in their mind and pretend that he did have secret information about what was going on in the organization. As he did this with different people, they were more willing to share information with him that they had because they thought that he was in the know. He discovered that one of the vice presidents was having an affair with one of the individuals in the office. He became very good friends with this individual, the young lady, and began to give her not only positive information about himself, because he was very uh, gracious and charming, but he also spread negative rumors about his boss, the person who he really wanted to replace. I called Bob Hare. He sent me a copy of the psychopathy checklist. I was shocked by the results. This person came out with a 30 out of 40. I called Bob back and he said to me that yes, in fact, I had been dealing with a psychopath. He referred to this person as a subcriminal psychopath. I now refer to them as industrial psychopaths. Are you there, Matthew 13? Look at verse 10. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10. The Pharisees were a bunch of reprobates. Notice what the Bible says. And the disciples came and said unto him, the disciples are talking to Jesus, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Remember all those parables you love to read and study? 
There's a reason why Jesus gave all those parables. He says, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now, some of it was to teach and to give us pictures, you know, uh, stories. But there's a, the main reason was this. When they asked him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Verse 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you, talking to the disciples, is, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, it is not given. He says, they will never come to the truth. They will never, it's not given to them. Verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. So notice, it's not that they didn't have the opportunity. They had the opportunity, but it was taken away. Verse 13, Therefore, for this reason, I speak to them in parables. Because they seeing, see not. He said, he said, it's not that they don't see. They can see. They have eyes. They see, but they see not. And hearing. It's not that they can't hear. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Don't miss this. And their eyes, they have closed. It's not, that, it's not that they couldn't see. They chose to close their eyes. They chose to not hear. They could hear. They could see. They could believe. They chose not to. And then God says, okay, I'm going to take away your opportunity to see, to believe, to hear. He said, you want to know why I speak in parables that they can't understand? Because I don't want them to understand. I can't believe that you would teach that Jesus would want, you know, everybody should be allowed to come in to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Well, Jesus didn't think so. He said, there are some people, I don't want them to hear it. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and reach out to them anyway. Okay, because you're better than Jesus. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and give the gospel to them anyway, because I think they might say, okay, you're a better soul winner than Jesus, because Jesus said, these people are so far gone, I'm even going to speak in parables, because I don't even want them to understand the sermons when I preach them. But you're better than Jesus. You're better than God. Well, I'm not going to give up on anybody. Well, God gave up on them. Are you better than God? Amen. You better than Jesus? Well, I'm just going to give the gospel to, to them anyway because I think, you know what? You, you are proud and arrogant Come on. to think that you are better than God. To think when Jesus says, hey, I speak to them in parables because I don't want them to understand. Notice verse 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears of duller hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted. He said, I don't want, notice, he's saying, I don't want them to be converted. He said, this is Jesus. And should be converted, and I should heal them. Look at verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Go to Matthew 15. Look at verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Doesn't that sound like Jude one twelve plucked up by the roots? Look, look at verse 14. Go reach out to them and see if you can get them saved. No, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. It doesn't sound like Jesus was trying to get these guys saved. It sounds like from such turn away. Have nothing to do with these people. As soon as you identify them as psychopaths and reprobates, get away from them. Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. This is Jesus speaking to them. For ye compass a sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, notice, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. What were they? Sons of Belial? Now here's what's interesting about the reprobate. Pharisees, right? The white-collar psychopaths, okay? Did the Pharisees commit murder like the reprobates we saw in, Ju in Judges 19? Here's the answer to that question. Yes, they committed murder. You know who they murdered? The Lord Jesus Christ. But how did they do it? They didn't go out themselves and, to kill Jesus. What they did was they manipulated people and society to do their dirty work for them. See, in the same way that there are two types of psychopaths, the Ted Bundys that go out in the middle of the night, find, you know, break into people's houses and violently kill them and rape them, and we see reprobates that do that, Judges 19, Genesis 19, but we also see psychopaths who 
play within the rules as far as not getting put in prison, but they use their power and they use their manipulation and deceit to get their dirty work done. We also see that with reprobates. Some of them are violent reprobates and some of them are white collar reprobates. And look, the white collar reprobates would, would, would kill and molest and rape as well. They just might do it differently. They just might use manipulation and their power. I want to deal with one more thing when we're talking about the classification of, of psychopath reprobates. I want to deal with this subject. What about psychopath reprobate children? Psychopath reprobate children. You say, can children be psychopaths? Can children be reprobates? Martin Smedley works with seriously disturbed children at a leading London hospital. He's certain there are signs of psychopathy in some of them who are very young, but current medical practice forbids him to diagnose it. You can't call a child a psychopath. You can't call a child somebody with a personality disorder. Um, one is still of the view that children can change, that actually change can take place over time, and that a personality disorder is something which you have as an adult, not as a child. I think there are also sort of ethical considerations for taking a small child and saying, well, this person is a psychopath. It has a certain sense of inevitability about it, of incurableness about it, and one doesn't want to look at children in that way. I think one needs to intervene as early as possible if there's any suspicion that this child is likely to develop a personality disorder is likely to become psychopathic or is showing signs of psychopathy. One needs to be able to identify what those signs are and intervene. Now, no psychologist will label a child a psychopath. That's because it's still potential at that stage. What they say instead is that they score highly on callous, unemotional traits. Professor Mark Dads has helped develop powerful training programs to help kids with conduct disorders. 10% of whom score high on callous, unemotional traits. All children make mistakes. They have times when they're aggressive and they lie and they manipulate. It's just part of human nature. But the thing about the children with these callous traits at extremes is that it's done deliberately, deliberately hurting the younger baby in the family or doing cruel acts to pets. And then when the parents try to talk to them about why that's wrong, it's kind of staring at someone you realise doesn't care. And that moment when an adult sees a child who seems not to really be connected to the pain of another person is a scary moment. Go, 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 go. Even so, Professor Dad's team was confident their powerful training program could change these kids. We were kind of touring the country going, we can treat kids even with callous and emotional traits. And when we looked at the data, we were kind of a bit horrified. The treatment didn't really work, which begged the question, why not? Back here in London is a scientist who may just have the answer. In a world first, Dr Essie Viding has been imaging the brains of children with callous, unemotional traits. So here we are focusing on a brain area called amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that processes fear and negative emotions. We showed children pictures of other people in emotionally distressing situations. Typically developing children have a strong amygdala response to other people's distress. Children who have high levels of callous and emotional traits show no discernible amygdala response to other people in distressing situations. So when I'm watching a film, if the character cries, I'll often cry. I guess that's my amygdala resonating. Would these kids or the psychopaths would, would nothing? not be bothered. Nothing? Nothing. No wonder they're different. Yes. You say, wow, they're psychopath children. Go to Genesis 19. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, behold, now my lords, turn in. I pray you, 
into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall arise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the streets all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compass that means they surrounded the house round right just like judges 19 but notice notice what it says verse 4 but before they lay down the men of the city even the men of sodom compass the house round notice what it says both old and young all the people from every quarter and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Again, talking about that physical relationship. Verse 6, And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. But here's what I want you to understand. And of course, that's similar to the story we just read. But here's what I want you to understand. The Bible tells us that in Sodom and Gomorrah, all the people from every quarter, both old and young, every male was there. Adults and young people. Go to Second Peter chapter number 2. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. That's probably a reference to children. That they are predators of children. That they are looking for unstable souls. In heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Don't miss this. Cursed children. Some of these reprobates have been cursed from their childhood. Psychopaths reprobate children. Go to, go, go to Deuteronomy 21. Now here's what's interesting about Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21 is one of the most ridiculed passages in the Bible. People who want to attack the Word of God, who want to attack Christianity, will often bring up Deuteronomy chapter number 21 as a passage to mock at and to say, that's the God you serve. But Deuteronomy 21, and I will say this, in the passage there's no reference to a reprobate, but Deuteronomy 21 makes a lot of sense when it's put in the context of psychopath children, reprobate children, cursed children. Let's read it, Deuteronomy 21, 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of the city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer's uh, parents identified that Jeffrey Dahmer as a teenager was a drunkard with a lot of problems. It might have, they might have saved a lot of lives. They might have saved a lot of broken uh, uh, mother's hearts if they would have just, you know, if, if they could have uh, done Deuteronomy 21. Amen. You say, well, what are they supposed to do? Look at verse 21. And all the men of this city shall stone him with stones that he died. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And people say, I can't believe you serve that God. If your child is not obeying you, you're going to take them out and stone them. And stone. Listen to me. When a mom and dad, if a mom and dad would be willing to do that to their child, you've got a reprobate kid on your hands. You say, oh, you know, you believe in Deuteronomy 21. That's the God that you believe in. You know, when you put it in the context of reprobate, it makes a whole lot of sense. Because obviously parents aren't going to be just using this on a whim. They, I would imagine that they were probably using this as a threat all, all the time, right? You clean your room or we're going to Deuteronomy 21 you. But you know, how, are there any real stories in the Bible where we see where parents actually, you know, did this? We don't see that. It probably didn't happen very often. But you know what? There are some people that probably should have done it could have done it. What lies at the end for a reprobate is that they are without hope. According to the Bible, they are without hope. What do the psychiatrists say about psychopaths? What do they say can be done for a psychopath? I am of the opinion that applying the usual psychiatric and psychological techniques only makes a psychopath a better psychopath. 
They, they learn how to fool others. They're, the treatment for psychopath is to find them, and if they've committed a crime, to convict them. This person's eyes might go like that. Criminal psychologists have long tried to understand why psychopaths are beyond reform. They don't benefit from rehabilitation the way other violent offenders can. Romans 124, wherefore God also gave them up. Romans 126, for this cause God gave them up. Romans 128, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Say, so, well, what do you do with someone like this? You put them in an institution, you try to reform them, you could use psychiatry and psychology. No, you know, the Bible says the only thing that's left for them, Romans 132, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know, God gets to the end of, of Romans 1, the quintessential passage on reprobates. He's talking to them about reprobates. And he gets to the end and he says, there's only one thing to really do with these people. And a responsible society would do it. And I'm not saying that we should go out and do this. I'm saying a, a, a society, a government would do this if they actually wanted to protect their people. They are worthy of death. That's the only way you fix a reprobate. With the growing hysteria, Ramirez knew it was time to get out of town. He ditched the stolen car and took a Greyhound bus to Arizona. But he left town without knowing a crucial clue had been left behind. The night of the crime, a teenager outside fixing his bike had seen him. And he saw this guy drive by that looked just like this composite sketch of the Night Stalker. And the kid got the license plate number. The police suddenly had the license plate number of the car the guy was in. They found the abandoned car in Orange County. While processing it, they discovered a clue on the rear view mirror. And apparently what happened, it was a very, very hot night. He took off his gloves at a point in time and he adjusted the mirror and he left one print. Finally, California's new fingerprinting system had now come online. When the fingerprint was processed, it matched the prints of a petty thief who had stolen a car in 1984 and spent six months in jail. The cloak of darkness in which he had hid himself was now torn off. The Night Stalker finally had a name, Richard Ramirez. His face was plastered on TV screens and newspapers. Police units were on alert all over the city. The biggest manhunt in Los Angeles history was in full swing. So we felt once the name went out and the photograph went out, that Richard would try to escape from Los Angeles through the Greyhound bus depot. Everyone was on the lookout for Ramirez, but the police were wrong again. As they meticulously staked out each bus depot exit, hoping to snatch him as he left, Ramirez arrived. We didn't know that Richard was somewhere in Arizona near Phoenix trying to visit a brother, and he was coming back into town. When he got off the bus, Ramirez saw the detectives, but he remained calm. And he walked right past them. He walked out of the terminal. He went into a grocery store to buy coffee. At the same point, a woman in the back of the store recognized him and she turned as white as a ghost and she pointed and she said, El Matador, El Matador, which means the killer. And he panicked, he literally panicked. He tried to get on a bus, people on the bus recognized him, they started pointing at him, it's him, it's him. He got off the bus. Ramirez began running for his life. He tried to steal a car, but people began shouting and running after him. Someone called the police, and 40 police cars and seven helicopters converged on the scene. He kept running, the crowd at his heels, but soon found himself at the end of his rope. When he was pulling this woman out of the car, she started screaming. Her husband came running from the backyard. He picked up a pipe and he ran over to him. He cracked him over the head with a pipe, and Richard took off and started running down the street. And everyone's yelling now, El Matador, El Matador. And in no time, there's like a crowd of 100 people chasing him down the block. They caught him. Somebody said, get my gun, get my gun. They knew who he was. And they got him to the ground, and they were stomping him and beating him. And the police came, and the police saved him. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Should we reach out to these people? Should we go on and try to get them saved? Having a form of godliness, well, well I gave the gospel as homosexual, and he got saved. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Say, so what do you do with them? From such, turn away. 
That's why we're not going to bring them in. We're not going to bring, well, we should bring in the homosexuals and we should minister to them and we should love. No, from such, turn away. That's what the Bible says. Leave them alone. That's what Jesus said. We don't minister to them. There's no hope for them. They're worthy of death. From such, turn away. You say, what do you do? What do you do with a, 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 with a reprobate? What's there to do? There's no hope. There's nothing to do. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, notice how the Bible calls them animals. They're not human anymore. But these, as natural brute beasts, as stupid animals, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. You say, what, what, should you, what do you do with a reprobate? You know, they're made to be taken and destroyed. That's really all you can do. And again, we don't do that. That's not our job. That's what society should do. That's what government should do. But that's what God says. He says they're worthy of death. Those who tend to believe in the goodness of, of humanity say, well, the problem with the psychopath is that uh, he or she was not properly treated as a child. And and uh, actually never learned to be empathetic toward, you know, towards other people and uh, really never learned to become attached or, or bonded with somebody else, a caregiver. And that's the problem. And we can resolve it in adulthood simply by giving them a hug, maybe a musical instrument and a puppy dog, and they're all going to be okay. Give them lots of love and understanding. With a psychopath, I would argue that emotion is, is like being colorblind. Uh, for them and nothing we can do is actually going to instill a sense of empathy. This is really a waste of time. I think that biologically or neurobiologically the mechanisms that should impart affect or emotion to one's cognitions and thoughts and attitudes are not working properly in psychopaths. Now, okay, when you look at a reprobate, at the consequence, the conclusion, the end of it, they, God says, there's no hope, put him to death, worthy of death, from such turn away. Well, what do the psychiatrists say about psychopaths? What do they say can be done for a psychopath? On page 194, he says this, many writers on the subject have commented that the shortest chapter in any book on psychopathy should be the one on treatment. A one-sentence conclusion, such as no effective treatment has been found or nothing works, is the common wrap-up to scholarly reviews of the literature. See, the psychiatrists get to the end of the psychopath teaching, and you know what they say? There's no hope. The Bible gets to the end of the reprobate teaching, and you know what it says? There's no hope. You ask the psychiatrist, what makes somebody a psychopath? No conscience. You ask the Bible, what makes somebody a reprobate? No conscience. Well, Pastor Jimenez, what's the point of the sermon? What's the point of the sermon? Here's the point of the sermon. And I want you to understand this. I'm sick and tired of Christians looking down their nose at me and preachers like me and say, well, I can't believe that you would preach that there are people who are predators, who have no conscience, who we should not reach out to, who we cannot reform. And that you are so uneducated. I can't believe that you would teach that there are reprobates. But you know what's interesting? is that in our culture, there are some very well-educated, well-respected men and women called psychiatrists. I don't necessarily believe in what they do, but if you talk to our culture as a whole, they would say, these are well-educated you know, people that help our society. And you know, all these psychiatrists have came to the realization that there is a class, a group of people in our society that we live with, that are predators, that are ruthless, that have no conscience, that'll stab you in the back and not give it a second thought. They, they came up with the same conclusion. The Bible calls them reprobates. They call them psychopaths. Isn't it interesting that God already told us about it? Turns out you didn't have to go to Harvard. Turns out you didn't need the psychiatry, you know, degree. Turns out you didn't need all those degrees. You could have just read the Bible. Because God already, the Bible calls them reprobates. The world calls them psychopaths. You say, what are they? They're psychopath reprobates. Because look, the only way to protect yourself from them is to learn the things that these people do. Because you're not always going to run into the Ten Bundys. You know, but you, you come across these people in your life. And by the way, let me say this. They're not all sodomites. 
I don't believe every, uh, every reprobate is a sodomite. Now, I do believe every sodomite is a reprobate. But I don't believe that every, I don't think the Pharisees were sodomites. You know, they might have been. Like the Catholic priests, child molesters, you know. But what I'm saying is, what makes you a reprobate is not that you're a sodomite. What makes you a reprobate is that you've been given over to a reprobate mind. That you lack a conscience. Now, let me end with this thought. There is one difference between us and the psychiatrists. We say they're without a conscience, they say they're without a conscience. We say they have no hope, they say they have no hope. They say there is no answer, the difference is we do have an answer. Because the Word of God gives you the answer to everything. You say, what's the answer to the psychopath reprobate dilemma? What's the answer to the psychopath reprobate epidemic? Well, here's what I think. I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if someone, if some soul winner was out on the streets of Milwaukee and maybe a young boy named Jeff would walk by them on his bike playing basketball at the park and they would have went to that young boy and said, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and you can be saved. I wonder what would have happened if somebody would have reached out to a young boy named Jeff before he was known as the Milwaukee monster, Jeffrey Dahmer. When he was abandoned by his mother who had her own mental problems. When he as a young teenager was literally living by himself because his father had moved out due to a divorce. When he was broken and hurt because these people were not always evil. They were children at one point that had the opportunity to say, I just wonder what would have happened if somebody would have reached out to a boy named Jeff and said, God loves you and God wants to save you and you don't have to go down that road. I wonder how many people's lives could have been saved. Somebody, some church that have cared enough to maybe reach that man or reach that mom and bring them into church and teach them how to raise their kids and teach them what to do. I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what would have happened if there would have been some church, some soul winner, might have maybe knocked on the door of a teenage boy named Teddy before he was known as the notorious all-American killer, Ted Bundy. A young boy who as a, 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 as a young teen was struggling with the realization when he came to the realization that the people he thought were his parents were not his parents, and the girl who he thought was his sister was actually his mother, and he'd been lied to his own life, and he, and he learned how to deal with that. He got angry and bitter towards women as a result of being lied to. I wonder what would have happened if somebody would have reached out to a nine-year-old Teddy, to a 10-year-old Teddy, to a 12 or a 13 year old Ted and said, hey, you know what? Man will fail you and man will lie to you, but God loves you and God can save you and you can be free. I wonder if he would have got saved. How many lives could have been spared? I wonder if someone would have reached out to a young boy in Los Angeles named Richard who was being molested by his school teacher, who was being exposed to filth and pornography by his reprobate uncle. I wonder what would have happened if somebody, some soul winner, would have reached out to that Catholic home and got that mom saved and got that dad saved and got them in church and got Richard in church and taught them that we don't have to live like animals and God loves you and, 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 and these people that have molested you and done you wrong deserve to die. I wonder what would have happened if somebody would have ministered to him. Maybe he wouldn't have grown up to be the night stalker who killed many women, men, children. See, the thing is, we have the answer. It's always the same. It's the gospel. It's soul winning. It's reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ because here's what the psychiatrists say. We don't know what causes it. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know what makes them a psychopath, but we do know they reject God. They get angry at God. They get mad at God. And you know what? We can reach them before they cross that line. We can get them saved. We can show them that there are people that love them, that want to protect them, that want to preach the gospel to them, that care about them. You say, what's the hope? What's the hope for the psychopath reprobate is to reach them before they are a psychopath reprobate.
J'aimerais vous poser une question. Si vous deviez mourir aujourd'hui, iriez-vous au ciel Peut-être vous n'y avez jamais pensé, vous ne vous êtes peut-être jamais posé la question. Mais la Bible dit que vous pouvez être sûr à 100% d'avoir votre place au paradis. Selon la Bible, il y a certaines choses que vous devez comprendre afin d'obtenir le salut. Tout d'abord, personne ne va au paradis parce qu'il est une bonne personne. Nous n'allons pas au paradis grâce à nos bonnes œuvres. En effet, la Bible dit en Romains chapitre 3, verset 23, « Car tous ont péché et sont privés de la gloire de Dieu. » Aux yeux de Dieu, nous sommes tous coupables d'avoir enfreint sa loi. Nous avons tous commis le péché, comme vous, comme moi. Chaque fois que nous avons menti, même désobéi à nos parents, ou convoité les choses qui ne nous appartiennent pas, comme des possessions, des richesses, ou, ou une femme qui n'est pas la nôtre, toutes ces choses-là sont des péchés. Et la Bible dit, nous sommes tous des pécheurs. Voilà pourquoi nous sommes tous coupables aux yeux de Dieu. Et la Bible dit, il y a un châtiment pour le péché, car Dieu est juste. Il ne peut pas laisser le péché impuni. C'est pourquoi il dit en Romains chapitre 6, verset 23, « Car les gages du péché, c'est la mort. » Ainsi, voilà pourquoi nous mourrons, voilà pourquoi nous devons mourir. C'est à cause du péché. C'est une punition, car Dieu doit punir le péché. Et quand la Bible parle de la mort, elle ne parle pas seulement d'une mort physique, mais cela parle surtout d'une mort spirituelle, de la mort spirituelle qui est l'enfer. Car quand nous sommes morts, nous allons soit au ciel, au paradis, soit en enfer. Et les gens qui meurent dans leurs péchés, sans être pardonnés, vont en enfer. La Bible appelle cela la seconde mort. En Révélation 21, verset 8, la Bible dit « Mais les peureux et les incrédules et les abominables et les meurtriers et les prostituées et les sorciers et les idolâtres et tous les menteurs auront leur part dans le lac qui brûle avec du feu et du soufre, ce qui est la seconde mort. La Bible ici nous donne une liste de pécheurs et nous dit, tous ces gens-là auront leur part dans le lac qui brûle avec du feu et du soufre, ce qui est la seconde mort. Il parle donc ici de l'enfer, de la mort spirituelle. Et nous, et nous voyons ici, dans cette liste, plusieurs péchés. Et Dieu veut nous faire comprendre que nous sommes tous dans cette liste et que nous, nous appartenons tous à cette seconde mort. Nous méritons tous cette seconde mort. Pourquoi Nous ne sommes peut-être pas tous des meurtriers, nous ne sommes peut-être pas tous des sorciers, mais nous avons tous menti, au moins une fois dans notre vie. Il faut bien l'admettre. Et nombre d'entre nous ont fait pire que ça. Et si vous dites « Non, je ne suis pas dans cette liste », là, vous y êtes, vous avez menti car nous appartenons tous à cette liste. C'est un endroit terrible et vous ne voulez pas y aller, car c'est pour toujours. L'enfer, ça dure pour toujours. Vous êtes mort et ensuite, c'est pour toujours. Ça ne s'arrête jamais. Mais Dieu est un Dieu d'amour. Dieu nous aime. Il ne veut pas que nous allions dans cet endroit terrible. Il veut nous sauver. C'est pourquoi il dit, en Romains chapitre 6, verset 23, comme nous avons déjà vu, « Car les gages du péché, c'est la mort ». Mais le don de Dieu, c'est la vie éternelle par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. Alors la première partie du verset, c'est la condamnation. C'est une mauvaise nouvelle, car les gages du péché, c'est la mort, oui. Mais Dieu ne nous laisse pas avec une mauvaise nouvelle sans nous donner un échappatoire. La deuxième partie du verset dit, Mais le don de Dieu, c'est la vie éternelle par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. Ainsi, si, si nous sommes condamnés, nous pouvons échapper gratuitement à la condamnation. Dieu veut nous offrir le don de la vie éternelle. C'est un cadeau que Dieu veut nous offrir. Et c'est par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. En Éphésiens chapitre 2, versets 8 et 9, la Bible dit « Car vous êtes sauvés par la grâce, par le moyen de la foi, et cela ne vient pas de vous, c'est le don de Dieu. Ce n'est point par les œuvres, afin que personne ne se glorifie. » Encore, car vous êtes sauvés, sauvés de l'enfer, sauvés de vos péchés qui vous conduisaient en enfer. Vous êtes sauvés par la grâce. La grâce, c'est quelque chose que nous ne méritons pas, mais qui nous est donné quand même, qui nous est offert gratuitement. Exactement comme quand le président de la République donne sa grâce présidentielle à un condamné, il dit simplement « Je te gracie, donc tu n'es plus condamné, simplement parce que je le veux ». Eh bien, avec Dieu, c'est pareil. Il veut nous donner la vie éternelle par sa grâce. Car nous ne le méritons pas, mais il veut nous la donner quand même. Car vous êtes sauvés par la grâce, par le moyen de la foi. Donc c'est par rapport à ce que vous croyez dans votre cœur. 
c'est par rapport à vos croyances. Et cela ne vient pas de vous, c'est le don de Dieu. Donc le salut, le fait d'accéder au paradis, au ciel, cela ne vient pas de nous. Cela n'a rien à voir avec ce que nous avons fait. C'est le don de Dieu. Donc c'est un don pour lequel Dieu a payé. C'est Dieu qui a payé pour ça. Au verset 9, il dit « Ce n'est point par les œuvres, afin que personne ne se glorifie. » En fait, il le dit de quatre manières différentes. De quatre manières différentes, il dit « Être sauvé est un cadeau de Dieu. La vie éternelle est un cadeau de Dieu. » Ainsi, c'est Dieu qui a tout payé. Et c'est pourquoi nous n'avons rien à faire. Nous n'avons aucune bonne œuvre à faire. Car les bonnes œuvres, c'est dur, c'est difficile, c'est du travail. Mais le salut ne s'obtient pas par les bonnes œuvres. C'est le don de Dieu. Et c'est pour ça que c'est une bonne nouvelle. Et cela a à voir, bien sûr, avec ce que Jésus a fait. Jésus est le Fils de Dieu. La Bible dit en Matthieu, chapitre 1, verset 22, à propos de la naissance de Jésus, la Bible dit, « Or, tout cela arriva, afin que s'accomplisse ce que le Seigneur avait dit en ces termes par le prophète, « Voici, une vierge sera enceinte, et elle enfantera un fils, et on le nommera Emmanuel, ce qui signifie « Dieu avec nous ». Car oui, son nom, c'est Jésus-Christ, c'est le nom le plus exalté de tous les noms. Mais on peut aussi le nommer Emmanuel, ce qui est simplement un, un nom hébreu qui signifie « Dieu avec nous ». Car Jésus, le Fils de Dieu, est Dieu manifesté dans la chair. La Bible dit « Dieu a été manifesté en la chair ». Il a vécu une vie parfaite. La Bible dit « Il a été tenté en tout point comme nous le sommes, cependant sans péché ». Jésus n'a jamais péché parce qu'il est Dieu, il est parfait. Il ne commet pas le péché, il n'y a aucun péché en lui. Et il prêchait le royaume de Dieu, il prêchait l'évangile, la, la parole de Dieu, la vérité. Et euh, il guérissait des gens, il faisait des miracles. Mais beaucoup l'ont détesté et ils ont fini par le livrer pour être tué et pour être crucifié sur la croix. Mais Jésus, pas, personne ne l'a forcé à aller sur la croix, personne ne l'a forcé à mourir pour nous. Il s'est donné de lui-même. La Bible dit en Romains chapitre 5 au verset 8, mais Dieu fait valoir son amour envers nous, en ce que, lorsque nous étions encore des pécheurs, Christ est mort pour nous. » Donc c'est par amour que Christ s'est donné sur la croix. C'est par amour que Christ est allé à la croix, volontairement a versé son sang pour nous. Bien que nous soyons des pécheurs, Christ est mort pour nous, faisant donc preuve de son amour pour nous. Il s'est offert volontairement, obéissant à son Père et accomplissant les Écritures de l'Ancien Testament. En Ésaïe 53, la Bible Prévoyez cela, au verset 5, la Bible dit à propos de Jésus sur la croix, « Mais il était meurtri pour nos péchés et frappé pour nos iniquités. Le châtiment qui nous apporte la paix est tombé sur lui, et par sa meurtrissure, nous avons la guérison. Nous étions tous errants comme des brebis, nous suivions chacun son propre chemin, et l'Éternel a fait venir sur lui l'iniquité de nous tous. » L'Éternel a fait venir sur Jésus, l'iniquité, c'est-à-dire le péché de nous tous. Quand il était sur la croix, en fait, Jésus portait le péché du monde entier. En fait, il était puni à notre place. Nous méritions de mourir, eh bien, il est mort pour nous. Il est mort à notre place sur la croix. Et il, a donc, il est donc mort sur cette croix. Il a été enseveli. Et trois jours plus tard, la bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'il est ressuscité. Il n'est pas resté mort, car il est Dieu. Il a le pouvoir de vaincre la mort. Il a vaincu la mort. En acte 2, versets 31 et 32, la Bible dit « Prévoyant cela, il dit de la résurrection du Christ que son âme ne serait point laissée dans l'enfer et que sa chair ne verrait point la corruption. Dieu a ressuscité ce Jésus, nous en sommes tous témoins. » Donc ils étaient témoins, les apôtres étaient témoins de la résurrection de Jésus et aujourd'hui, vous entendez cette histoire, Jésus est ressuscité, il est vivant et il est assis à la droite de son Père dans le ciel. Ainsi, puisque Jésus a payé pour nos péchés et qu'il est ressuscité, il a donc le pouvoir de vaincre la mort. C'est comme ça qu'il a payé pour le don de la vie éternelle. Comment faire pour obtenir cette vie éternelle Eh bien, comme tout cadeau, vous avez le choix. Vous pouvez soit l'accepter ou le refuser. La Bible dit en Romains 6, 23, « Car les gages du péché, c'est la mort, mais le don de Dieu, c'est la vie éternelle par Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur. » Vous pouvez donc choisir d'accepter ce cadeau par la foi, car vous ne voyez pas Jésus aujourd'hui. Vous ne voyez pas, vous ne l'avez pas vu ressusciter. Et vous entendez cet évangile et vous pouvez décider d'y croire si vous voulez. Et vous acceptez ce cadeau par la foi. La Bible dit en Jean 3, 16 « Car Dieu a tellement aimé le monde qu'il a donné son seul Fils engendré afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse point, 
mais qu'il est la vie éternelle. Ici, il est mentionné quiconque croit en lui. Il n'est aucunement mentionné le fait d'aller à l'église ou d'être baptisé ou de faire des bonnes œuvres. Bien sûr, ces choses-là sont bonnes, mais en ce qui concerne le salut et la vie éternelle, il est seulement mentionné quiconque croit en lui, c'est-à-dire quiconque a la foi en Jésus, quiconque croit que Jésus est mort sur la croix, qu'il a été enseveli et qu'il est ressuscité pour payer pour, le, pour nos péchés. Si vous croyez cela, la Bible dit « vous avez la vie éternelle ». Alors voilà comment vous recevez le cadeau de Dieu, voilà comment vous recevez la vie éternelle. La Bible dit en Romains chapitre 10, verset 9, « Que si tu confesses de ta bouche le Seigneur Jésus, et que tu crois dans ton cœur que Dieu l'a ressuscité des morts, tu seras sauvé. Si tu confesses de ta bouche le Seigneur Jésus, c'est-à-dire si tu admets être un pécheur en danger de l'enfer, condamné à l'enfer, et, et que tu confesses que Jésus a effectivement payé pour tes péchés sur la croix et qu'il est ressuscité, bien sûr, il faut aussi que tu, que tu y crois de ton cœur, il faut que ça vienne du cœur. La Bible dit, si tu confesses de ta bouche le Seigneur Jésus et que tu crois dans ton cœur que Dieu l'a ressuscité des morts, tu seras sauvé. C'est une promesse. Il ne dit pas peut-être avec un peu de chance, tu seras sauvé. Ou... Non, il dit, tu seras sauvé. C'est une promesse de Dieu. C'est pourquoi il dit, au verset 13, « Car quiconque invoquera le nom du Seigneur sera sauvé. » Si donc vous lui demandez, il promet de vous sauver et de vous donner la vie éternelle. Et de la même façon que vous n'avez rien fait pour mériter cette vie éternelle, il n'y a rien que vous puissiez faire pour perdre ce cadeau une fois que vous l'avez reçu. Quelqu'un qui croit en Jésus, même s'il commet du péché plus tard, et il en commettra sûrement, car nous péchons tous les jours, Dieu a donné ce cadeau. Et on avait l'habitude de dire, quand on était enfant, on disait « Donner, c'est donner, reprendre, c'est voler. » Et puisque Dieu vous a donné la vie éternelle, si vous lui avez demandé, il ne peut pas vous la reprendre, car Dieu est juste. Une fois qu'il vous a fait un cadeau, c'est pour toujours. Pour vous assurer de ceci, je vais vous lire ce que dit Jésus en Jean chapitre 10, versets 27 à 30. « Mes brebis entendent ma voix, et je les connais, et elles me suivent. » Les brebis, ce sont les croyants, ce sont les gens qui ont invoqué le nom du Seigneur, comme dit, comme dit la Bible. Ce sont les gens qui croient en Jésus-Christ. « Mes brebis entendent ma voix, et je les connais, et elles me suivent. Et je leur donne la vie éternelle, et elles ne périront jamais, et nul ne les ravira de ma main. Mon Père, qui me les a donnés, est plus grand que tous, et personne ne peut les ravir de la main de mon Père. Moi et mon Père, nous sommes un. » Donc quand vous, quand vous croyez en Jésus-Christ, quand vous êtes un croyant, quand vous avez cru à l'Évangile, la Bible dit « Jésus vous tient dans sa main et personne ne peut vous en arracher. » Parce que ça ne dépend pas de vous, mais c'est lui qui vous tient. Et de la même façon, vous êtes dans la main de son Père. Et il n'y a personne qui est plus fort que Dieu le Père. Donc il vous tient et il n'y a, a rien que vous puissiez faire pour, pour sortir de là. Et personne ne peut vous en arracher car ça dépend de lui. Et c'est lui avec son pouvoir qui vous retient. Voilà pourquoi quand vous êtes sauvé, vous êtes toujours sauvé et vous pouvez avoir la paix. D'ailleurs, Dieu dit, je, je ne me souviendrai plus de leurs péchés ni de leurs iniquités. Voilà pourquoi vous êtes sauvé pour toujours et vous avez la paix avec Jésus. Tous vos péchés sont pardonnés et oubliés. Ainsi, si vous avez cru ces choses, j'aimerais vous inviter à formuler une prière. Je peux vous aider à formuler une prière. Si vous croyez que Jésus est mort pour vous sur la croix et qu'il est ressuscité, pourquoi ne pas prier avec moi dès maintenant voilà ce que vous pouvez dire à Jésus. Cher Jésus, je reconnais être un pécheur et mériter d'aller en enfer. Mais je crois que tu es mort pour moi sur la croix et que tu es ressuscité. Je te prie, s'il te plaît, de me pardonner et de me donner la vie éternelle. Gloire à toi. Merci. Amen. Voilà. Si vous avez prié cette prière et que vous y croyez dans votre cœur, vous êtes sauvé. Félicitations et gloire à Dieu.